There is a rhythm we all seem to be born with. For some, it's musical. For others, it is athletic. But no matter how it presents itself, it is as real and steady as a child's heartbeat. And it has always been there, more noticeable in some, perhaps, than others, but as consistent as a clock, this gentle ticking inside us all. This love of motion, this passion for precision. Even if you think you've outgrown it, lost the childlike cadence to the drumbeat of daily life, you need only pause beside a playground to hear it echo deep within. A hundred years ago, that something within us reached out for something new. Perhaps we didn't perceive its primal need at the time. Perhaps it was conceived for more practical and spiritual reasons. But in the cold winter of 1891, a man named Dr. James Naismith presented mankind with a gift, the game of basketball. It was Christmas time in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Dr. Naismith, a Canadian-born theologian, had taken the job as a physical education instructor at the YMCA in Springfield. His challenge was to develop a new game for the long winter months between football and baseball seasons, something that could be played indoors, something that would maintain the natural metronome of athletic rhythm while the playgrounds of the Northeast were covered with snow. And because two other instructors had tried and failed to produce, his boss, Dr. Luther Gulick, gave him only two weeks to do it. So as most of us would, Dr. Naismith pondered the problem of modifying the outdoor sports to an inside game with little success. Until, of course, it was time to produce. And the day before his deadline, frustration turned to inspiration. He would use the principles of the existing games to fashion the new one. There would be a ball handled with the hands, but no running or personal contact would be allowed. And most importantly, the goal would be elevated. It all seems so simple today, but in the midst of creation, circumstance is quite often the mother of invention. On the morning of December 21st, 1891, Dr. Naismith, soccer ball under his arm, began searching about the YMCA for the perfect goal. He had envisioned boxes about 18 inches square, but the superintendent of buildings, Mr. Stebbins, could only find two peach baskets, a little larger at the top than the bottom, about 15 inches across. Originally, Dr. Naismith had intended to place a box in each corner of the gymnasium with play going across the floor. But now, with two peach baskets and hammer in hand, he nailed a basket to the lower rail of the balcony at each end of the gym, exactly 10 feet in the air, the distance from the floor to the railing, an accidental perfection that has not changed in over a century. His posting of the baskets, however, is one of the few basic points of the game that has not undergone dramatic evolution through time. That and the 13 original rules that he penned that same day, just hours before his students jumped center in the world's first known game of basketball. He didn't have any circles. In fact, he didn't have any lines on the original game. In the original game, he just had some uh, objects to say it's out of bounds if it goes past that. But the most amazing thing is he, Dr. Naismith, was the first official. He's hardly ever mentioned this, that he was the first official in basketball because he taught them the rules on the way into the gym and he refereed the first game. He had a pad too, he told us, because he had to keep track of all the fouls and 
you know, they had, if you had two fouls, they had to go out of the game and stay until another, uh, until a basket was scored by either team, then you could come back. So the first game, for instance, ended one to nothing. Only one shot made. And uh, the number of players on the court, I found out, were nine players on one side and five on the other. There were four guys fouled out, and they couldn't come back because nobody made any basket. The doctor had delivered his promise. This new game, with no name, was an instant success, even though just one goal was scored on that December 21st. No one can 100% document the date of December 21st as the birthday, but we can get it into a category where it's around a couple of days, and the world accepts that day. But that was just one game, in one gym, in one town. And even Dr. Naismith, we presume, had no idea what he'd created, that a simple game would awaken the rhythms and spread like a course across the land. The phenomenal growth of the game would start when his students returned home for Christmas break. They quickly introduced the game to their local YMCA's. And even in its infancy, it would not be limited to its Native America. Balls began to bounce as early as 1892 in Mexico and kept bouncing to Canada, Europe, Japan, China, South America, and around the world. A universal chord had been struck, but it would undergo many interpretations before it found its harmony. One of the early problems with the new game was that it had no name. The rules were first published in the Triangle, the YMCA's Journal of Physical Education, on January 15, 1892, under the simple heading, A New Game. But this nameless wonder would soon receive its permanent identity. For one day, after his students returned from their Christmas vacation, Frank Mahan, one of the original captains in that first game, made an office call on Dr. Naismith, acquiring about the name of the game. Naismith replied that he had never thought about a name, but only was concerned with getting it started. Mahan then suggested it be called Naismith Ball, but the doctor quickly replied, hey, that would kill any game. Then logic took over. Since we have a basket and a ball, Mahan said, let's call it basketball. The doctor concurred, and the issue was settled. Basketball it would be, a term that endured as two words until 1921, when it melded into one like notes in a melody. Coming up with a name, however, was easy compared to meeting the challenges of change that were coming. The 1894 basketball guide stated there would always be diversity in the game, that it could be played on any kind of ground, in a gymnasium, a large room, a small lot, or a large field. And if a large number of men wished to play at once, two balls could be used at the same time. This idea of diversity in the game came from Naismith himself, who devised it strictly to spur interest for physical education during the long winter months. He never dreamed the game would reach star status as a competitive sport, but the players and fans would soon change that. Within a year of its creation, college students adopted the game, but intercollegiate play was slow to develop. The first game played between two colleges was on February 9, 1895, when the School of Agriculture, affiliated with the University of Minnesota, defeated Hamlin of St. Paul 9-3. In 1901, however, the first conference was established, a triangular league with Yale, Trinity, and Wesleyan. And by 1905, basketball was a permanent winter sport at the college level. By then, the sounds of basketball were just strains of an awkward composition passed along by traveling troubadours. But soon, its many parts would become one. It was during these years of evolution that individuals began to insert their own refinements to the game. As early as 1892, Lou Allen of Hartford, Connecticut, replaced the peach baskets with cylindrical baskets of heavy woven wire. A year later, the Narragansett Machine Company of Providence, Rhode Island, manufactured baskets with heavy iron rims and braided cord netting that were complete with a pull chain to release the ball. Early on, inventive souls were cutting the bottom out of the nets, an idea that seems simplistic today, but was not accepted practice until almost another decade. And even the ball itself had to evolve naturally, carefully, with time. Before 1894, there was no such thing as a basketball. Players used soccer balls. 
Then there were the early cowhide basketballs that resemble footballs with rubber bladders squeezed inside and sewed up with a seam on the outside. And there were many other versions, all the products of our sense of rhythm, our search to find the true bounce, something that would echo the cadence that we heard inside. The only thing I could probably tell you about the ball, we used to test the ball by rolling it on the floor and it would hop, it had lumps all over it. And the people today and the youngsters today wouldn't realize that the ball, basketball, had the laces on it like a football. And the ball was bigger in circumference than it is today, and we couldn't handle it. We weren't that big as the players are today, so they couldn't grab it and dunk it with one hand in that. It wasn't until 1937 that the laceless ball was legalized, and the molded ball, like the one used today, did not become the official ball until 1949. It was during this first 50 years of evolution that the game of basketball seemed to find itself not only in the refinements of its rules, but in a myriad of smaller details that formed its individuality. There were no uniforms, for instance, in the early days, and players simply wore whatever they wanted. Most, in fact, looked more like their counterparts on the football field, wearing long woolen jerseys and long pants complete with pads. Over time, the sleeves and pants got shorter and the armor was discarded. But compared to today's game, basketball had become a raucous sport for players and fans alike. Ask today's fan what the term cager means, and you might have to go into overtime to get the answer. For as early as 1895, the game had become so intense that the players literally had to be enclosed in cages to keep the players and the fans separated. Another rule that they had in the early game was uh, when the ball goes out of bounds, the first player to get to it can throw it back. He uh, finally found basketball being put in a cage. And that's where the word cager comes from, because basketball had to be put in a cage. When it got so bad with this rule that they had to do something uh, by the spectators. The spectators would line themselves around the court, and when the ball would go out of bounds, they'd grab the ball and throw it back to their own team or their favorite team. And the biggest fights and pileups equal to football were on the sidelines. So then they put it inside of a cage to keep the spectators from interfering. Various materials were used, including chicken wire and nets. And the game from the inside had a little different rhythm. That called for certain things as you drove in, see the guy, if you got the ball, he'd grab it and tie up in there and then the hell ball. It had the other one in the corner. Here's the corner of the net, right here. He grabbed both sides, see, and tie up. As soon as the ball is dead by a tie up, see, it's a hell ball, see. And then they take you a little away from the net, and you and I are jumping again. We just tied up, and I want to kill time or something. The referee throws the ball up, I don't know, lift and hit the net and dive on the ball, and I'm killing time. There were all kinds of tactics. Uh, to meet the situation. Right in the court, as you would see, only just, it was put in there in that cage. I only did that one time at a totally Shawnee, Oklahoma. I never forgotten it. When we had to open that door, just like an animal, and you close the door and there it goes. It got pretty rough, too. And the backboard? Well, you might think it was an original concept designed to aid the bank shot, but it really came about as a necessity to diminish the home court advantage. In those early days, you see, with the basket nailed to the lower edge of the balcony, an enterprising fan could easily stick his hand through the railing and guide the ball in or swat it away. The first backboards, therefore, were introduced in 1893 to keep the play on the court and the fans in the stands. Since those early days, backboards have been made of wire, wood, glass, steel, and then back to wood and glass. Though the balconies are long gone, the home court advantage and the shots off the glass are still with us. Other parts of the game were changed and redefined as it went along. For in the beginning, there was no jump circle, no mid-court line, no free throw lane or boundary line. But as the court began to take definite shape, still, 
It was not uncommon then to have a man fast breaking around a pot belly stove or using the wall as well as his head. We did play it off of the wall, but see, in that day, the, the, the court was so small that a circle here would touch the center. You know, that's, that's how close it was. That was awful close. You know, you couldn't hardly play. If we hadn't been able to play it off that wall, we couldn't go down the floor. And there was the problem of how many players would be on the court. There was no limit, according to the rules, although Naismith originally felt that nine was the ideal number. Since his physical education class had 18 students, and his first game, therefore, employed nine players on each team. The 1894 basketball guide, however, stressed that five-man teams were best for championship play. And in 1897, the rule was changed to limit the number of players to five per team. Still, there were details to figure out. In the beginning, field goals counted one point. And to make sure a rough play didn't dominate the game, one of the original rules stated that if either side made three consecutive fouls, it would count as a goal for the other team. Later, feeling the rule was too severe, the value of the field goal was changed to three points. But the scoring battle wasn't quite over. The free throw back then counted the same as the field goal, three points. So to make scoring more balanced, in 1895, the field goal was changed to two points and the free throw reduced to one. Then there was the matter of the dribble, originally conceived as a defensive measure. But something this innovative was soon perceived as a valuable offensive weapon. By 1896, the dribble game had become a popular style of play. It naturally follows, therefore, that in 1898, there appeared the first rule restricting the double dribble. And in 1899, it was ruled that a player may dribble with either hand. The dribble continued to be one of the exciting developments in the game, but in 1927, the dribble was put back on the defense. Concerned with charging fouls, the rules committee voted to limit the dribble to just one bounce, a move that brought the coaches off the bench and into the fight. The uh, International Rules Committee, uh, actually it's the U.S. and Canadian Rules Committee, had instituted a rule where they were going to permit only one dribble after you receive the ball. And uh, most of our uh, prominent coaches, predominantly out in the Midwest, Fog Allen in particular, uh, was irate about this uh, uh, rule without even consulting the coaches. So they called a meeting uh, that summer in June in Chicago, and uh, it gave birth. Uh, they had quite a number of basketball coaches uh, attend this meeting, gave birth to the NABC. A constitution was adopted and officers were elected, and they lobbied strongly uh, at, at that time, and uh, that rule was rescinded. Coaches have played an integral part in harmonizing the game's variations into one coherent rhythm. Even back in the early days, they moved around, taking their knowledge and expertise on the road. Even Dr. Naismith made a coaching change. In 1895, Naismith moved to Denver to earn his second degree at Gross Medical College and continued coaching at the local YMCA in his spare time. Then three years later, he took up residence at Kansas University, where he introduced basketball and became the school's first and only losing coach with a record of 55 wins and 60 losses before turning the program over to Dr. Forrest C. Fogg Allen in 1907. It's Fogg Allen who's credited with the title Father of Basketball Coaches. For it was he who saw the game as a science, one expressly designed to be coached an opinion not originally adhered to by the game's inventor, but one Dr. Naismith later adopted. Dr. Allen later called the basketball, uh, the father of basketball coaching, felt that it was a game that you could develop strategies and systems. Dr. Naismith clung to the idea that it was just a game and uh, spectators weren't, weren't the answer. You don't uh, play a game for people to watch, you play a game for people to take part in. So it was a different uh, way to go. But I think uh, 
Dr. Allen's idea prevailed, as you can see. It's impossible to credit all the early coaches and players who helped lay the foundation for basketball's greatness. But besides Fog Allen, four names loom paramount. Cam Henderson, Frank Keeney, and doctors Meanwell and Carlson. Meanwell built a precision offense at Wisconsin based on teamwork and the short pass. While Carlson at Pittsburgh established a continuity game which featured a three-man figure eight pattern. Henderson coached at Davis and Elkins, then Marshall in West Virginia. He was the originator of the standing zone on defense and one of the early pioneers of the fast break on offense. Frank Keeney at Rhode Island used a fast break and pressing defense that resulted in a racehorse style of play that was producing a point per minute before the elimination of the center jump. All of these innovations provided a harmonizing balance to this new emerging rhythm. You have to have balance, you have to have movement, you have to have a floor balance, you have to have squad balance, you have to have rebound balance, you have to have offensive balance, you have to have defensive balance. There's just balance in, in every area of the game. And I think continuity, to me, in, some, in one sense, means a balance, too. Today's coaches, of course, make much more money, but the stress level almost matches their paychecks. It is interesting then to note how much things have changed as Doc Carlson, a practicing medical doctor while coaching, explains his relaxation prescription in an interview before his death in 1964. My main vocation is medicine. And uh, uh, in that particular job, you face, uh, as I said before, the breadwinner possibly dying and six or seven kids around there looking at you uh, up to you as if you're the god and uh, you, you're pretty low and you go home and you can pray and still you have the uh, idea of death uh, in your mind and uh, you've got to do something. So I suppose some people read the Bible or uh, play cards or get drunk or something. In my case, I uh, uh, used to make these O's and X's in my prescription book. And, uh, of course, it was a matter of uh, evolving primarily as, uh, uh, as an avocation, uh, something to escape. By 1930, the country was in an economic depression, but the game of basketball was on the verge of its biggest boom. Since its inception, it has steadily become the nation's number one participant sport. But the next decade of progress would make it the number one spectator sport as well. In 1930, the technique of the stall had become widespread in basketball, an ingredient that not only held down the scores, but the game itself. I saw a game between Pittsburgh and, and uh, USC where the guy in the backcourt sat in the ball for about 12 minutes in the backcourt, read, read a newspaper there, and Doc Carlson had his guys up at the other end. He used to do that against uh, Penn State. One time he came to a game and had a whole arm full of newspapers. He had a great big bag over here. And Penn State used to play that zone. And so he gets and he's throwing the newspapers all over and he's throwing peanuts and all these other things up in the stands. And said, so, what the hell are you doing that for, Doc? He said, well, they don't see much of a game tonight. <laughs> so I want him to, you know, to be able to be doing something while we stand around, either eat or, or, or read the paper. So by 1932, a major step was taken to curb the stall with the introduction of the 10-second or mid-court line, which created the front and back courts in basketball. This was followed by the three-second rule to help clean up the play inside the lane. By the mid-30s, the players were getting bigger and better, and so were the complaints that the big man had an unfair advantage. 
As early as 1931, Fogg Allen had proposed that the goals be raised to 12 feet to neutralize this advantage of height, but his suggestion never got off the ground. He didn't ask Dr. Naismith what his thoughts were. He thought Dr. Naismith would just agree with him. And without any warning, at the convention, he cited Dr. Naismith in the audience, and he asked him to come forward and give his views. And Dr. Naismith gave the shortest speech on record at the, the convention. It hadn't been any shorter uh, since and none before. He came to the front and said, no matter where you put them, the tall men will always be the closest to them. And went back to his seat. However, in 1937, the rules makers did address the problem by eliminating the center jump after each basket scored. Although this rule change was designed to cut the big man down to size, what it accomplished was the speeding up of the game, a factor that not only filled the stands, but made the game a marketable product nationwide. Well, I think the abolishment of the center jump, to me, that did more to change the, the game completely than anything else. In 1934, basketball was played according to zip code. The fast break was more prevalent in the Midwest and South. Defense and ball control were dominant to the West, and on the East Coast, set patterns with outside shooting were the norm. Although fans were fanatic all over the country, New York City in general, and Madison Square Garden in particular, soon became the center of the basketball universe. The first doubleheader held there on December 29th 1934 drew more than 16,000 fans, and the Garden became the showcase for the nation's best basketball. USC went back and, and, uh, and played uh, in the Garden and played Long Island and some of the other teams back there. And uh, they, they had Philadelphia, Convention Hall, and Buffalo, and the Garden, and you had a three-game trip and you would get enough money out of those three games to pay your expenses. But before that, no, you couldn't. You couldn't afford to go back there. It was just too much money. The Madison Square Garden had so much to do with the growth of basketball. And Ned Irish and John Goldner, both of them, uh, John doing the scheduling and Ned, you know, setting everything up. They, I, I, I believe that they had a, as much input in, in bringing basketball to the point it is as, any, as anybody. This was historically the beginning of regularly scheduled intersectional basketball in this country. The single thing that brought basketball from all regions together for all to see. And sometimes what they saw amazed them. Out on the West Coast, Stanford Hank Lucetti had developed a style of play most people had not seen before. His repertoire included running one-handed shots, behind-the-back dribbles, and some nifty defensive play all of which he brought to the garden in 1936, and some say changed the game forever. Of course, I was very fortunate that we went back east. And going east, that's where New York, it was always the media at that time, center of the country. If you did well in New York, you were made. Well, we were playing a team, Long Island University, that had won 43 straight. And of course, they thought well, they were gonna beat this very easily. Well, it turned out we beat them, I think I got six one-hand shots. So at the end of the game, I was, reporters came over and said, where did you learn to shoot that shot? And uh, my coach said he's been doing it since he was a youngster. It's probably safe to say that the game Dr. Naismith created took on a life of its own and quickly surpassed his limited vision of its impact. The growing enthusiasm for basketball led to the first national tournament for colleges. Although Naismith himself helped start the small college NAIA tournament in Kansas City in 1937, it wasn't enough to satisfy the growing hunger for major college competition and championships. So a year later, a group of New York sports writers, capitalizing on the enthusiasm generated by promoter Ned Irish, organized what became known as the NIT, the National Invitational Tournament in Madison Square Garden. The garden itself 